I'm Dr. Anil Gudi. I'm a consultant in reproductive medicine and surgery and assisted conception at the Homewood University Hospital, London. As usual, I will be bringing one or two reviews, journal cases and case discussions once or twice a week for my trainees which I put online and these can be observed by anyone across the world. Today I'm going to talk on the subject of endometriosis. What is the impact of excision of endometrioma on ovarian reserve? We see a lot of endometriosis and it's an important question that we often ask. Should we operate on endometriomas and how extensive should that surgery be? Now this paper is a meta-analysis. Again, as I said earlier, meta-analyses have a certain limitation to research and also in that same aspect will not give us an absolute answer. But it does give us some ideas of how we need to pursue surgery or non-surgery in endometriomas. This was published in 2012 in a journal of clinical endocrinology and metabolism by Mustafa Metwali and his team from University of Nottingham. Now, we know about endometriomas. We know that it probably occurs in about 20% of all endometriosis. Surgery is the main treatment. And there's a risk to the surgery of damaging the ovary. There are two techniques which we use during surgery. One is cystectomy where you strip the cyst wall and you take it away. And the other is cyst ablation where you burn the cyst wall. These are the two techniques which have been practiced for a long time. Cystectomy is a more complete surgery. There's a greater removal of ovarian tissue along with the cyst wall. But also, there is less recurrence. The incidence of recurrence is substantially lower. And maybe this is the best surgery if childbearing is not an option. Cyst ablation causes less damage to the ovary, but because you've not taken away a small areas of endometriosis and the cyst wall may remain intact, there's a greater risk of recurrence. To check the ovarian reserve, we use the anti millerian hormone, which is a validated test for ovarian reserve. What was the aim of this study? The aim of the study was to evaluate the impact of surgical treatment of endometrioma on ovarian reserve by measuring the AMH. A large number of studies were looked at and eight studies were taken. These cases had significant size endometrioma. They were less than 40 years of age and they should have a good ovarian reserve. A cystectomy had to be done in all these cases and endometriosis had to be confirmed by a histological diagnosis. When we looked at the initial results and the initial results were very simple and straightforward, they suggested that the AMH level approximately dropped by 40% after a cystectomy. That for, a, for an initial review, it's quite scary. If you're going to drop the AMH significantly, then we have to question how much beneficial the surgery would be when these women decide to go in for surgery. The second question which was asked was, when do we do the AMH test? And often uh, this is 
asked to all of us, do you do the AMH test immediately? Do you give it six months? Do you give it a year? Usually, AMH tests are done at the follow-up, which is approximately three months time. There were two studies which did AMH tests as multiple measurements. A sub-analysis was done, which looked at AMH in six to nine months time. And what was noticed that the AMH, there was sustained fall in the AMH throughout the follow-up period. And that is something which the study across the groups did indicate. And also that the AMH did not recover after six to nine months time. Now, that is something which is important. It probably indicates that the damage to the ovary after surgery may be permanent and that recovery with the growth of new follicles may not be possible. Now what happens with bilateral endometriomas? In fact, if you look at the meta-analysis, there seems to be a greater damage to the overall AMH, a greater reduction to the AMH, if you operate on bilateral endometriomas. In unilateral endometriomas, the drop to AMH was about 30%. In bilateral endometrioma, the drop to AMH was almost 44%. That means almost the AMH dropped by half, which also indicates that if you have bilateral endometrioma, your damage to ovarian tissue is going to be far more than operating on a unilateral or a single endometrioma. Now, what is if the endometrioma is large? And here, the study, the meta-analysis does not tell us very clearly. It indicates that in very large endometriomas, there seemed to be a smaller drop of AMH. On the other hand, if you had a woman who had a very good AMH level and there was a large endometrioma, the drop was probably more. Now, you could look at it in two ways. Number one is that in women with average endometrio, average size ovaries, average reserve, if you take out an endometrioma, the remaining ovary is not significantly significant in size and probably your AMH is not going to decline because the ovary is small. Now in large ovaries, you your surgery is going to have a bigger impact on the leftover tissue and probably that does indicate is if you have a very high AMH, again, is there a role of doing a huge amount of surgery before you decide to go for any form of fertility treatment. The second most important method of looking at ovarian reserve is to do the antral follicle count. For any form of fertility treatment, antral follicle count is a far better indicator of ovarian response and it entirely depends on your skills had been able to look at these antral follicles. Now, when they looked at this meta-analysis, they did not see a dramatic drop in antral follicle count. Now, there are multiple other studies which I'll be presenting in the next couple of weeks, but this is probably due to the difficulty in measuring antral follicle when all, there's already a large endometrioma and the numbers were small, so they were not very conclusive about the role of antral follicle in this study and its relevant drop to AMH. Though I, my personal opinion here is that if you do a extensive surgery, you are going to take away the growing follicles and the non-growing follicles. And when you take away the growing follicles, your enter follicle count is going to come down. And that's something which is important to realize. Now the next thing is there are limitations to antral follicle count and AMH as markers of ovarian reserve. So let's go back to the basics. What is ovarian reserve 
An ovarian reserve is defined as the total follicle pool which consists of the resting primordial follicles and the growing follicles. So you need a combination of both these follicles. And often what I tend to say is follicles that you can see and follicles that you can't see. And currently we do not have any test or any method that can completely measure the antral follicle count. Both tests reflect the number of the small antral follicles rather than the total pool. So you have to remember that there are limitations for our AMH test. And at present, we are only looking at follicles which are extremely small or the follicles which you can see as antral follicles. The other area of concern is that there has been no study randomized which looked at ablative surgery, which is that you open up the endometrioma, you burn the endometrioma, you don't take away the cyst wall. And there is, doesn't seem to be many studies that look at endometrioma and its ablation being better than cystectomy. In conclusion, ovarian cystectomy seems to cause significant damage to up to 40% fall in AMH levels. So th there seems to be very good evidence that when you do a cystectomy, you will see a decline in AMH. The question which you often get asked is, then what do we do? Do we stop doing cystectomies? And I would say, have a rethink about it when you go in for surgery. Have a talk with the fertility specialist. And if you are a, a specialist like me who does surgery as well as medicine, I tend to have a look at it and tell the patient, what do you want? You have endometrioma. Now there is evidence that if you remove an endometrioma, if you treat an endometrioma, then the chances of spontaneous conception increase. Now balance the risk. And if you leave, if you treat an endometrioma, if you leave it, we know that endometriomas can recur. And my way of treating it is often to say, do you want to start your treatment in about two or three months post having an endometrioma surgery done? Either if it's going to be a cystectomy or if it's going to be ablative surgery. And that discussion with either with you wearing two hats is very important or with your colleague is important that if you decide to do a cystectomy on somebody who's got a very good reserve, then absolutely fine. You know, but it's very important to decide how, when do we start fertility treatments. Let's provide that this patient's main complaint has been that she wants to have a baby and does have pain. Now, what happens to cysts that are three, two centimeters, three centimeters? My general belief is that leave them alone. Do not try and treat them. If somebody is in pain, absolutely you have to treat these cysts because pain is a reason why surgery should be done. But in the absence of pain, as I told you in my earlier talk, the role of doing surgery is limited. The role of doing extensive surgery is limited. If you decide to do extensive surgery, remember, try and do an AMH before you operate on the woman. And also warn her that there will be a decline in surgery. And sometimes it's important to balance how much you operate versus how much you save. It also differs from condition to condition. Now, thank you very much for listening to this talk. I have a few more reviews lined up. Again, for my trainees, it is very good and beneficial because it's for consultants to review papers. It gives a different perspective from our own experience that comes up. If you want to ask any questions, I've been away for about 10 days. Do send me an email on fertilitycourses at gmail.com. 
If you do want to visit our center or you want to do the course that is conducted by IBC, then I would suggest that you email IBC who conduct these courses. We do not have more than 40 or 45 people in each course because it's very intensive when we teach them. But I hope that you continue to share these videos. It is good for me to continue reading and trying to put it on video. It is also good for people across the world to be able to share knowledge because that's an absolutely fantastic thing. Anyway, thank you very much. Bye.